This is Long Wave, featuring technical analysis and market analytics by Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. The content of this presentation is strictly the opinion of Gordon T. Long and is based on his analysis, which he feels to be accurate and unbiased. Participants may or may not hold positions in any securities that are discussed. You should always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decisions. Now, let's join Gordon for today's show. Good morning. It is Wednesday, September the 7th, 2016. I'm Gord Long at GordonTLong.com. A reminder before we begin, do not trade from any of these slides. They are commentary for educational and discussion purposes only. Always consult a professional financial advisor before making any investment decisions. The purpose of the audio slides is to talk about the areas that are not updated in your monthly analytics and technical analysis report. This is based on our annual cycle as outlined on the subscriptions page on our site. We intentionally keep the technical analysis charts to the subscriber report so as not to confuse them with the drivers operating behind them. Drivers in the long term are primarily the fundamentals. In the intermediate term, it's about risk. And in the very short term, it's about confidence and sentiment of investors and consumers. This month, I'd like to cover a range of linked topics listed here. I'd like to talk about whether the fundamentals, the risk, or investor sentiment really matter in a manipulated market. The short answer is that it depends on how the market is being manipulated. We'll explore that and then what the most likely conclusions are. First, let's talk about fundamentals. The conventional explanation to justify the S&P trading just shy of 2200 is that the market has been the beneficiary of an unprecedented multiple expansion. To be sure, as Goldman recently opined, the median stock multiple has never been more overvalued. The real reason is in the collapse of the equity risk premium, or the ERP, as a result of plunging bond yields which is the direct method by which the central banks monetize government and now corporate debt. It clearly defines the almost panic hunt for yield in a repressive financial regime. Decomposing equity returns into earnings growth, changes in PE and changes in the risk premium shows that the bulk of equity performance is best captured by the shunt lower in equity risk premiums. According to Deutsche Bank's Dominic Konstam, and I quote, this means that every push higher in yield, whether orchestrated by central banks or due to events like a taper tantrum, risks upsetting the precariously compressed ERP spring, leading to a violent market crash. Because if the ERP is responsible for 92% of the S&P 500 moves since 2012, or just over 800 points, that would suggest that central bank policies are directly responsible for approximately 40% of the value in the market. And any moves to undo this support could result in a crash that wipes out, say, RP contribution, leaving the S&P somewhere in the vicinity of 1400 Ouch. The Federal Reserve is petrified about even the smallest 25 basis rate hike, and you can see why. It is no secret that earnings have gone nowhere over the past two years and are set to decline for the sixth consecutive quarter as we've been continuously reporting over all six of those quarters. Well, on a gap basis, earnings as of 2015 were the lowest since 2010. The gap blue line has been falling dramatically while non-GAAP earnings have been rolling over but on a quarterly basis have experienced those six consecutive declining quarters. When you don't have real earnings and only magical mystery accounting earnings, the place to look immediately as an investor is at the cash flow reports. Cash flows seldom lie and they are a major concern for reasons we've been dis we have discussed in previous reports. Debt is now being used to not only allow unjustifiable stock buybacks and shareholder dividend payouts, but more and more is being required to fund basic operating costs. 
Corporate stock buybacks now dwarf critically required business investment. Elevated dividends and buybacks help thwart predatory takeover attempts and allow stock to be used as an M&A currency. This occurs when risk-adjusted growth can only be found through M&A and not through any organic means. All of the above suggests the equity market has major fundamental concerns and we've been dwelling on this for quite a few quarters now. So I think for our long-term investors there's nothing new here except it just is getting worse. Let's switch to a little closer in of what controls the market and that is risk, risk in the intermediate term. First, we look at the European Central Bank and the Bank of England buying of corporate bonds. Why is it that six years after the GFC or the Great Financial Crisis and a touted economic recovery that the ECB and the BOE felt forced to recently implement the unprecedented monetary policy of purchasing corporate bonds. The spin we are awkwardly asked to accept is that it is due to potential fallout from the Brexit referendum vote. If this is the case, why is the UK Guardian already reporting that consumer confidence has rebounded since the vote, as we're in the process of putting in this new policy specific at the Bank of England? Clearly, this was actually part of a larger plan, and Brexit was just a handy excuse. I just read that two large European non-financial companies were the first in history to be paid by investors to borrow, courtesy of the ECB's new corporate debt monetization program, which has unleashed unprecedented scramble for front-running the central bank's purchase of corporate debt and a historic collapse in bond spreads. Uh, make sure you realize what's happening is everybody knows they can sell these bonds to the ECB, so why not buy them or issue them and then turn around and have them sold? As the Wall Street Journal reported earlier, German multinational Henkel AG and French drug maker Sanofi SA are set to collect a yield of minus 0.5% on new issues of short-dated bonds. The German household products manufacturer is set to sell 500 million euros of two-year bonds that yield negative 0.5% while Sanofi will be paid to issue three-year debt. As the Wall Street Journal conveniently adds, in case someone is still unaware, the fundraising is another sign of how unprecedented monetary policy has turned conventional investment theory on its head. And that's a quote right from the Wall Street Journal. Roughly 717 billion euros of Eurozone investment grade bonds traded at a negative yield as of the end of August or over 30% of the entire market. The ECB had bought over 20 billion of corporate bonds as of September 2nd after launching its program in early June with most of its purchases coming in secondary markets. The results are shown here. In a note by Bank of America's Barnaby Martin, the strategist said he was starting to, and I quote, think the unthinkable. Namely, what happens when double B names slide into the negative yielding category? And I quote him. Such has been Drahi's influence over the whole credit market that we are close to seeing our first negative yielding double B rated bond. But if debt costs for speculative grade companies become inverted, then the economics of LBOs will be transformed and the quality of the assets they are buying will become secondary. We see a growing risk that another private equity cycle emerges in Europe now and the severe ratings deterioration that LBOs pose would become the greatest challenge to central banks' credit buying. It is only a matter of time before the ECB also makes the unthinkable all too real. The central bank meets this week and will decide if it should expand its current bond buying program. As routers and the Wall Street Journal hinted previously, the ECB will soon be forced, and I quote, forced to buy equities to f which will further distort the markets. The new debt sales mark a burst of issuances following the traditional summer lull in the local capital markets. According to the Wall Street Journal, Glencore, and we did a special on that about a year ago, 
which last year was locked out of the debt markets, is also raising cash this week in one of its first forays into the capital markets since its shares and bonds were sold off last fall amid concerns over debt levels and falling commodity prices. To be sure, while the fundamentals facing the company are still as dire as ever, the fact that the ECB provides a guaranteed backstop assures that anything the Swiss commodity has to sell will be promptly soaked up by the yield-starved markets. What a place to operate in! And you think every CEO isn't taking full advantage of this game? Let's talk about Japan, the Swiss National Bank and the Central Bank of Israel buying the stock market. Again, why is it that six years after the GFC, the great financial crisis and a touted economic recovery, that central banks like the BOJ, SNB and Israeli Central Bank feel forced, forced to initiate buying the equity markets, or in this case, the Bank of Japan, taking on levels of 60% of the nation's ETFs. I, I thought the re we were in a recovery. It is one thing to continue with aggressive and untested monetary policies, but I think it's altogether another to feel they need to enter a realm even greater and never before even postulated. It begs a lot of questions. I read, as we do this report, that Reuters is floating a disturbing trial balloon. The ECB may be forced to buy stocks, according to this troubled Reuters trial balloon. And I quote, that may be just the beginning. ECB may be soon be forced to follow the Bank of Japan's example and buy equities as part of any expanded stimulus program. There are problems everywhere in the European banking community. I have written recently about the ticking time bomb at Deutsche Bank. I now read that Deutsche Bank is trying to explain why it did not deliver physical goals and it had many fails. What is really going on there? What does this mean? And I quote Deutsche Bank, we recommend in each specific case an individual review of the economic efficiencies of physical delivery. Should an investor's request for the handover of physical gold not have been complied with immediately individual ca in individual cases, this will be reviewed and an individual solution will be found with the client. This sort of gobbledygook answers nothing and only a child cannot see through the poorly disguised veneer here. Global monetary policy is out of runway, and belief in it is quickly fraying. A rapid refocus to fiscal stimulus spending to keep central bank balance sheets growing can be expected in the new year. The first priority after the U.S. elections is a globally coordinated infrastructure stimulus plan. The question is, why is it that six years after the GFC and a touted economic recovery that central banks feel this is urgent and mandatory? Let's switch to the short term. That is sentiment. I believe, and I've written about this in this year's thesis paper, we have a crisis of trust. And now that trust is spilling over into a loss of confidence in the central banks. As might be expected from what we've discussed previously here today, we see a significant decay in confidence in the European Central Bank, a decline that compares to levels seen during the European banking crisis and Grexit, the Greek debacle. But is it just the ECB? The U.S. Federal Reserve is also steadily losing credibility, even with changes in the leadership. It's a steady, ongoing decline, or should I say decay. The University of Michigan sentiment indicator dropped to its lowest since 2016 low in April, driven by drop in hope from the flash print, stuck at lowest level since 2014. It needs to be pointed out that this is opposite to what the conference board's consumer confidence reading is suggesting, or what the government wants us to believe and the controlled conference board has likely been co-opted into reporting. Just so you don't think I'm being conspiratorial here, Gallup also suggests a falling confidence index and not the conference board's two standard deviation spike to the upside last month. Buybacks, we've talked extensively about those, but they have ran, I believe, they have run their course. They will still go on, but they're falling off. The fact that buybacks are weakening also just suggests confidence and sentiment is shifting. 
So what's all this lead us to from a conclusion? Well, I look at this as, as really what I see is a bell curve barbell in the in, showing that risk in the intermediate term is quite elevated. As we've spelled out many times before, in the short term markets are under the influence of investor sentiment and confidence. In the intermediate term risk and in the long term the fundamentals. Interestingly, I believe we see all levels of concern but that the intermediate term risk is actually higher. This is similar to a classic bell curve where sentiment and fundamentals are at either end but still very elevated. The question is, what could trigger a sudden and abrupt phase shift occurring where short-term sentiment and long-term fundamentals become even more elevated, because we can see they're decaying at a, at a very significant rate, become elevated to the intermediate-term risk levels? We're at levels where similar to water turning to vapor or turning to ice, it can transition very quickly when all three send the same message. This is exactly when major market drawdowns occur. A phase shift, and they all align, and suddenly the long term is the immediate and the short term. The risk of policy errors or poor execution, such as premature increases in rates or withdrawal of liquidity support, is increasing. An intended or accidental breakdown within the Eurozone potentially triggering a restructuring of the European single currency is no longer inconceivable. Global economic wars entailing barriers to trade, as Trump's talking about, or capital movements, as well as the ongoing currency devaluations, are likely as countries act independently consistent with their national interests. This is to be expected, but any one of these push us into a phase shift. The signs of breakdown are evident and everywhere. The failure of existing policies is pushing central banks into more extreme and desperate actions, such as negative interest rates, effectively paying people to borrow and large currency devaluations. Actual market volatility has increased as valuations reflect anticipated central bank actions rather than the fundamentals. For example, the fallen yield of sovereign bonds reflects the expectations of central banks' purchases rather than true risk, as we just talked about regarding buying of corporate bonds. Deflationary pressures in commodities and industrial prices are increasingly global. Behaviors now are economically irrational. The magnitude and speed of adjustment in commodity prices, currencies, credit markets, suggests that a correction may occur more quickly than people or the market is anticipating. I'm not trying to scare you here. I'm trying to simply indicate the position that we're at. It could go on for a long period of time. And believe me, the government, central banks, and powers to be, that is their intention to extend and pretend as long as possible. But as I said at the beginning, we're running out of runway here. Most investors remain oblivious, assuming that the risk is in the price or that they are prepared and will be able to adjust their portfolio in time. They remain long risky assets, often on a leverage basis. I flew power and gliders uh, as a younger man. And aviators have um, a term or a fear that they take something they call the coffin corner. The term refers to the minimum speed needed to avoid an aircraft stalling and losing altitude, potentially resulting in a fatal loss of control. The aerodynamics of modern aircraft means that the difference between the minimum speed below which the plane can stall and the maximum speed beyond which it also loses control and potentially breaks up is small, especially at elevated altitudes, at high altitudes it becomes very small. Today financial markets and the global economy are flying at the coffin corner. Unexpected turbulence or instability wherever its source will, can, and surely will result in a major breakdown with rapid spread of losses and problems. Now consider the fact that six central banks have a balance sheet that is equivalent to nearly 40% of global GDP, a number which is extrapolated to be 
over 50 percent by 2018. Those wondering if this means that central banks are engaged in a creeping stealth indirect leverage buyout of the world's assets on behalf of third parties the answer is perilously close to a resounding yes but who knows for sure while everyone was delighted in the early days of the fed and then global quantitative easing when central banks were the buyer of first and last resort helping push asset prices up if doing little for the actual economy the only real question asked in the dark, tinfoil-covered corners of the smart money universe is whether the cost of quantitative easing has now outweighed the benefits. It has run its course. I believe it has and is no longer working. Let's look at some of the, the, the goals of, of the overall policies. It was to achieve a stated goal of 2% inflation. I don't see that here. As a matter of fact, I see it completely the opposite of achieving that, and that's universal with any, any of the central banks that have adopted this policy of a 2% inflation target. Matter of fact, I would argue it's creating deflation because it's creating excess supply in the emerging markets to build products that uh, the developed economies can no longer afford to buy because they have a tapped out middle class consumer. So it's making the problem even worse by having money this cheap for manufacturing or for the supply chain. It's, let's talk about normal levels of economic growth. It's been 16 months since the European Central Bank began its voyage into unknowable in March 2015 and as the Financial Times notes this week marks a milestone. It has now purchased over one trillion in government and corporate bonds since it began quantitative easing. The ECB buys bonds through the Eurozone National Central Bank and in line with a member state's overall contribution to Eurozone GDP. Among its three largest economies, the ECB has snapped up a total of $238 billion in German bonds, $189 billion in French paper and $164 billion Euros in Italian bonds since last March. Policymakers announced they would begin buying non-bank corporate debt earlier this year. Total ECB holdings of company bonds now stand at 20.5 billion euros, with asset-backed securities hitting nearly 20 billion euros. The ECB will be meeting for its latest monthly policy decisions, as I mentioned earlier, this Thursday, and is poised to announce a six-month extension on its quantitative easing program until September 2017. This is, doesn't sound like the end of a recovery. It sounds like the beginnings of attempting a recovery. According to estimates from Credit Agricole, the ECB will have accumulated over half the eligible universe of government debt by the end of the year, forcing policymakers to tweak their quantitative easing rules in a bid to keep hitting its 80 billion euros a month purchase target. That's right, the ECB's targets right now are 80 billion a month in euros um, to be purchased. There's not enough supply out there. The trillion euro surge is driving ECB's balance sheet up towards the feds. And the big problem is it's not helping. At least it's not helping the real world. Manufacturing and trade is down globally to match the failed inflation targets I just showed. EU and global growth is not occurring and expectations are it's going to get worse. Therefore, we must conclude that central bank monetary policies are either pure propaganda-driven lies or the people pulling the strings are blinded by faith and aiming for cognizant dissidents um, on a world record level or something else is underway. And I side with actually the last. Goldman's Peter Oppenheimer summarized it here and it shows something stunning. The 10-year rolling nominal earnings growth rate has collapsed to negative 1.8% in Europe and has fallen to record lows for the global equity market. We're so preoccupied by looking at things on a monthly, quarterly basis, or even on a yearly basis, we tend not to look at the trends over a longer period of time. This is an unmistakable collapse in earnings and growth. This drives everything when earnings are falling, falling at this rate. As I have previously written, I believe the credit cycle has now turned, along with 
as is well documented, a fall in even the officially reported GDP. Our financial system is now so highly leveraged that any fall in collateral values of stocks and bonds will be devastating. Something must be done, and in fact, I believe is being done, to offset what would naturally um, occur at this point in the economic cycle. So what may be occurring? Well, first, central banks, government entities, and pensions, as well as sovereign wealth funds, are now buying publicly traded financial instruments. It has been reported that well over $30 trillion has now been accumulated by these public sector entities globally. Secondly, it is my educated opinion that U.S. corporations have been for quite some time are using their huge offshore money uh, to avoid paying taxes on it if they um, um, repatriate it to the United States, but are using that money through offshore SPC, SPVs, structures to buy their bonds to supply cash for their stock buybacks. And remember, at the end of the day, they return the money to their SPCs or their SPVs. So it's just a game to drive up their stocks using their own cash offshore. Haven't you been wondering who would be buying their corporate bonds at minimal yields with potential credit downgrades due to high levels of debt and falling cash flows? And yet they keep getting bought? People aren't stupid. There's got to be another gig going on here. I believe the U.S. government is fine with this because it assists in keeping the financial markets levitated. And that's why there's good tax breaks on this debt for them to do this. Thirdly, I think additionally it appears we have a potential giant leverage buyout occurring. We're seeing the fewest stocks traded in 32 years. The market is disappearing in one giant leverage buyout. It's easy to find critics and doomsayers who predict that the next stock market crash is just around the corner. You know, as I'm pointing out, they could be right, and it looks like it. But another possibility is that the stock market itself will disappear. The number of common stocks traded on major U.S. exchanges are the fewest in three decades. This is the end game of unfettered capitalisms. Surely these signs are either going to change or we're going to march on to this possibility. In the upcoming Under the Lens video report, which will be entitled, What are the Central Banks So Afraid Of?, I'm going to discuss this in much more detail. Specifically, we'll delve into the GDP growth illusion and the increasing productivity problem within the developed economies which is driving all of this. So, until then, remember, no matter what, they will print the money. Thank you for listening, and I hope 2016 turns out to be a great investment year for you. Thank you. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.